So good morning, everyone. Welcome to Data at Scale Track. We have a great uh, lineup of talks from Twitter, Facebook, Box, Instagram, Pinterest, Microsoft, Uber, Airbnb, Google. So nine companies presenting today. And I'll give you a quick overview of how the day, uh, day will go on. We have one hour talk in the beginning uh, by Twitter and the last one hour talk by Google in this room. The rest of the talks are 30 minutes and they are split into data analytics, which will be in this room, which is about offline data processing. And the next uh, room, which is right across the hallway, will be used for the data serving track, which is about serving data at users' requests. So that's the distinction, one hour, one hour, and a bunch of 30 minutes split into two sessions. Regarding Q&A, we will take some questions as we get time, but I highly encourage you guys to make use of the bright white and orange colors that we have outside of the couch area, uh, to, and all the speakers will be there outside uh, to take any of the question area, and it will be a great opportunity for us to mingle today. So with this, uh, I want to welcome Karthik from Twitter, and uh, he'll be talking about uh, Heron, the stream processing at scale. Oh, this one. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. So I'm Karthik. I manage the real-time analytics group at uh, Twitter. So my talk will be on Twitter Heron, which is the new streaming engine that we uh, developed recently and put into production. So all the questions, I, as Smitha said, uh, we'll kind of defer it to the office hours, because I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. So the agent of my, my talk will be first to give an overview of uh, why we do real-time analytics, and also like uh, emphasize some of the Storm terminologies, which was our first generation real-time engine that served our needs. It will be followed by some kind of a motivation, uh, why we did Heron, and what was wrong with Storm. Then I will delve into more details about what Heron is all about and share some of the operational experiences with it. Then finally, like uh, I'll share some of the performance numbers that we had when we compared with Storm. And finally, I'll conclude it. To give an overview, so Twitter is all about real time. So a lot of things goes on in Twitter in real time. And one of them is real time trends that emerges based on hashtags, what are the hashtags that are news and uh, other various uh, conversations that can break out of those Twitter conversations. Then real-time product recommendations that take advantage of the fact that uh, the new, uh, the real-time conversation that is going on, we wanted to kind of introduce a product based on those conversations. So finally, they have real-time search, which allows you to do, in, allows you in the Twitter, sorry, tweets to index very quickly so that the Twitter shows up in the search as well. So analyzing all these events, billions of events in real time is a challenge for us. And uh, that's why we are big into real time analytics. So Twitter Storm has been our first generation real time streaming engine that has served our needs for a long time. So what is Storm? Storm is nothing but a streaming platform that allows you to analyze the real time data the moment as it is produced so that you can react quickly as the data is being produced. And it has four important properties. First is called guaranteed message passing. And uh, typically, all the streaming system has these three different type of message processing. One is at most once. Another one is at least once. And the third one is exactly once. And Storm supports at least two of them, at most once and at least once. And it's horizontally scalable in the sense like uh, you can add more capacity to the cluster as it grows so that uh, the jobs can expand to those new machines whenever there is a need. And it also supposed, supports robust fault tolerance because in the presence of machine failures and uh, process failures, the failovers are automatic without any manual intervention. And finally, like, oh, sorry, I pressed the slide a little bit earlier. Oops. Okay, and finally, one of the properties it provides is the 
allow you to focus on your code logic rather than doing all the plumbing, which is essentially moving data uh, between one operators to other operators. So the Storm terminology. So to give a, before we go into Heron detail, I just wanted to introduce a few Storm terminology so that you can understand the talk better. So all the real-time jobs in Storm are referred to what you call as topologies. And uh, a topology is nothing but a DAG. And the vertices of the DAG represents some kind of, a, what you call, it, computation. And the edges of the DAG represent streams of data flowing between those operators. So there are two type of vertices. One is called spouts. The other one is called bowls. The spouts are essentially like inject data into the real-time job. And some of the examples of the spouts include what you call Kafka, Kestrel, or even uh, take data from an existing OLTP databases like uh, MySQL and Postgres. The second one is bowls, and bowls is where the actual action is happening. So it takes the data, incoming data, does some kind of a transformation or some kind of a computation on top of it, and pushes the data out. And some of the examples of those computation includes filtering, aggregation, and even join or any arbitrary machine learning function. So yeah, how, how does this storm topology looks like? So it's, as I said, it's a DAG. And uh, here, in this case, you have two spouts which are injecting data continuously into the first stage sort of bowls, which are like three bowls, bolt one and bolt three. And these bowls do some processing on the data that is input by the spout one and spout two. Then the second set of, uh, and they pump the data back to the second set of bowls called bolt four and bolt five. So now, the major difference between the MapReduce and the uh, job as a storm topology is like two things. One is MapReduce, like every time, uh, for every, it is consists of two stages. And uh, un un unlike uh, MapReduce, storm can have any arbitrary number of stages. So we have even seen jobs that are even like 10 stages to 15 stages long. And there's no limitation on the number of stages where you can st stitch together. And the uh, second aspect is like, uh, Whenever uh, in the map reduce, there is a checkpointing going on at every stage. In uh, Storm, there is no checkpointing. Instead, the data is just continuously flowing between those uh, spouts and bowls. So to have a concrete example, consider the simple tweet word count topology. So here, what we are trying to do is like we want to count the number of distinct words that are occurring on a stream of tweets. So, so we have to have something called a tweet spout. And that spout is uh, uh, tapping into the data sources of uh, getting these Twitter stream or the Twitter li timeline feeds. And the, it pumps the data, the, the tweets, into what we call as a parse tweet bolt. And that parse tweet bolt is essentially is going to break up the tweet into words and uh, generate those words. And the words are pumped into the next one, which is called the, the word count bolt. And the word count bolt is, uh, will be counting these words uh, coming across these uh, different tweets. And uh, the, some of the examples could be the World Cup hashtag is occurring 1 million times, or a soccer word is occurring like 400,000 times. So, so like that is the topology that I sh showed you is what we call as a logical plan in, uh, like a sim in the parlance of the database systems. And when the topology gets actually realized in the physical hardware, so since the data, data rate or the data, a sheer amount of data is to be handled is very high, so we, can't, we won't be able to process within a single spout or even a single bolt. Instead, we need to have a multiple instances of these spouts and bolts, which we call them as stacks. So when the actual topology gets realized in the hardware, there is multiple instances of what you call the tweet spout, spout and multiple instances of a parse tweet bolt, and similarly, multiple instances of a word count bolt. So the number of instances is uh, controlled by uh, when you actually launch the job or when you tune the job such that it can be able to handle the data rate that you're expecting. And that poses an interesting question. How, uh, whenever uh, data is emitted from the parse tweet bold, one of the instances of the parse tweet bold, where should the data should end up in the word count bold? So, so when a parse tweet bold task emits a tuple, which word count bolt should that have to send the data to? So Storm provides something called uh, groupings in order to accomplish that. And uh, the first grouping is essentially like uh, what we call a shuffle grouping. And shuffle grouping essentially allows you for a random distribution of tuples. In other words, like uh, you can pick any bolt and randomly and send the data to. 
The second uh, grouping is called fields grouping. It uh, takes into account the field values of the tuple that is being emitted. And based on those values of the field, you push the data into the appropriate bold accordingly. So then there is something called all grouping. All grouping allows you to, um, what do you call, uh, replicate the tuple to across all the bowls downstream. And there is a final grouping called global grouping. And global grouping allows you to collect all the data coming from the previous stage bowls into one single bowl. And this is used for mainly printing the results and other things. And most of the time, in any real-time job, you end up using the shuffle grouping and the fields grouping. And coming back to our example of a tweet count, um, so if you annotate your topology with uh, appropriate grouping, so from a tweet spout to a parse tweet bold, you, you, you will require shuffle grouping because you don't need to know where the tweet is going. Because as long as the tweet is broken up into words, you're fine. So which means shuffle grouping is suffice. Whereas from parse tweet count bold to word count bold, you need to have a fields grouping. Because uh, you want the words across the same word across multiple tweets should end up in the same bold so that the count is accurate. So finally, like uh, so motivation. So Stomp has been used for several years. Now, why we have to do redo a new engine? So, so, so the motivation will outline all the problems that we faced in production of uh, for running for close to three years. So, in order to understand uh, the real motivation, we need to delve more into details about the Storm architecture itself. So. Storm architecture consists of uh, two different uh, type of nodes. One is called the master node, which essentially runs a process called Nimbus. And uh, there are the rest of the other nodes are all called slave nodes. And a Storm representative called supervisor runs on those nodes. And these supervisors uh, kind of listen on one of the uh, hierarchy in the zookeeper. Um, so when a topology gets uh, submitted, uh, so it uh, comes to Nimbus. And uh, Nimbus kind of acts as a scheduler as well. So it, the Nimbus looks at the topology, finds out how much resources it needs, and matches its resources with uh, all the tuples, or, or sorry, with matches its resources with all the available machines, and accordingly figures out where it has to schedule those uh, that topology. So then it writes something called assignment maps. So assignment map essentially describes like I want to run a fragment of this topology on node one and the next fragment in on node two, et cetera. So that is returned in Zookeeper. And once it writes into Zookeeper, the supervisors on the, all, all the nodes wake up and uh, figure out, oh, is this assignment map as something for me? The moment it has something for uh, uh, that particular supervisor or particular node, then it uh, downloads the actual real-time jobs code, the jar and other things that you submit as a part of the topology. And it downloads the entire jar. And finally, it spawns off what you call as a storm worker. And these workers are the ones that actually crunch the data, taking the, the, the spout and all the uh, tasks, as well as the bold task, run within this context of this worker. Um, so now, let us take a look at what is wrong with this architecture. So we experience a lot of issues with Nimbus itself. First of all, Nimbus serves uh, multiple purposes. One is um, it acts as a scheduler, because it just keeps track of all the machines that are available, and which one is running how many uh, cores, and how many cores of those machines are being used, all kind of things. And also, it uh, serves as a monitoring for whether a particular topology is alive, or, uh, or, or the portions of those topologies are alive, or even the node is alive, So, which means some kind of heartbeat mechanism is going on to detect all these uh, failure. So the second aspect is like, uh, even though Nimbus acts as a scheduler, it does not uh, enforce any kind of resource reservations. In other words, if a topology requires, or if a topology's worker requires, like, uh, OK, I have three cores followed by 10 GB of memory, and, uh, and Nimbus finds admission and uh, schedules it there, and it has no way of enforcing that worker indeed uses only like uh, the two cores and the 10 GB of memory. Because after that, it's up to the worker to manage itself. And uh, so then the third one is uh, it is, serves as a single point of failure. Because uh, the moment the Nimbus goes down, that is, uh, you can't submit new topology. And also, like uh, if a failure occurs, then the uh, portions of the topology which needs to be relocated will not be relocated as well. And uh, Nimbus also was serving for the UI, where 
you can get statistics about all the topologies and its corresponding tuples and various things. And uh, so some of the observation was like when we are running on a few thousand nodes, so when we hit on the UI and click on a, even a particular topology to get its statistics, it took like three minutes to get back because the Nimbus was always so busy. So when we go detail into a storm worker, it has even more hairier design. So first of all, the storm worker is nothing but a JVM process on its own. And within the JVM process, there is a notion of executors. And the executors are loosely, you can call them the threads. Actually, it's two threads per executor. And within the executor, you have these multiple tasks that keeps running within that. And uh, these tasks represent essentially your, uh, uh, what do you call the parse tweet task or even the word count bold task. And what is wrong with the storm worker? Because of these multiple multiplexing layers where uh, the JVM process are running on top of an operating system, and within the JVM, your threads are being scheduled, and within the each uh, thread, you have these task schedule on, go, scheduling going on. So which means there is a multiple scheduling algorithm that keeps running, and there is no clear predictability about when a particular task will get scheduled. So again, like uh, it's very hard to debug. Because of the multiplexing nature of whole uh, worker, we end up having um, a very difficult in terms of debugging, especially if the logs are coming out at a faster rate, spit out by all this task running in this same JVM process, it's very difficult to isolate which task was spit out what and uh, when you're looking at a long lo set of logs, especially in a distributed system. And uh, that made us like very difficult to even debug any small issues, even if you make any mistakes in a bold code, it's become very difficult to locate them. The third aspect is very difficult to tune. How do you assign the resources for this worker? Because it's a function of how the tasks are being packed into it. And uh, if the tasks are very disparate in nature, how do you allocate these resources to it? So it was very difficult to tune. So most of the tuning was done in an ad hoc fashion where um, we just try some uh, uh, X amount of resources and see the graphs of uh, how it looks like. Oh, OK, it doesn't look like good. Then again, change it to Y number of resources, and again, uh, rerun the job and see. So this was more of an ad hoc and um, what you call a manual process, which took even a few weeks in order to get the job right before it goes into production. So um, now let us look at into the data flow within the storm worker. And because of this multiplexing nature of the storm worker itself, it's even the data flow is even hairier than what it should be. Um, so there is uh, something called a global receive thread, which in turn receives the actual uh, data coming from the other workers. And uh, once the global re receive thread re receives uh, data, it uh, demultiplexes in the sense like uh, if a data is, could be meant for different tasks. So what it will do is like uh, uh, it break up those uh, messages into these individual tuples, and the tuples uh, for destined for a particular task are queued into their appropriate queue. And you have one queue in queue per task that is running inside the worker. So then that in queue in turn will be the data in the in queue will be taken up by the user logic thread. And the user logic thread is where your actual task code is actually running. And this user logic thread in turn uh, crunches the data. And after that, what he's going to do is emit the tuples. And the emitted tuple is going to kind of put into the output, output queue. And that output uh, queue is, again, one per task. And the sender thread, which is associated with each output queue, takes the data out of it. And uh, then after that, sends into the outgoing message buffer, where that data is kind of, again, reassembled uh, based on the destination where it has to go to. Then it goes to the global send thread. Um, and it goes to other workers where further stages of processing will occur. So again, like, what are the problems with this approach? So when Storm was using what he called multiple different libraries. One is like for the uh, across process communication, it was using something called zero MQ. And uh, within a process communication, especially between the in queue and out queue, it was using something called uh, disruptor queues. And this disruptor queues was uh, written by Wall Street folks. And uh, it uses uh, something called a busy waiting whenever there is no data, which causes more uh, CPU usage and also like causes queue contention when it, data was going at a high throughput. So that, uh, that often end up being over-provisioning. In fact, like uh, I'll give you some numbers later. So we end up over-provisioning by 8x to 10x in order to deal with it. The ne next one is like uh, Storm is written in multiple languages. 
which is the core of the storm language is called uh, closure, which is more Lisp-like and it's more functional. And it also used uh, what he called uh, the, and it runs on top of JVM. And the user programs or the user topologies or real-time jobs are written in Java. And uh, some of the libraries that are being used like the 0MQ and a few other libraries are written in C++. So the interplay of these languages on the same system leads to GC issues and GC pauses. So then uh, one more issue, there are a couple of more issues. One is called the overloaded zookeeper. So um, when the storm was originally deployed at Twitter, we were sharing a single zookeeper with the critical services as well as in the storm. So we found that like as we were adding more and more real-time job, the zookeeper was coming to a little bit of a grinding halt. And uh, so in order to make sure that we don't uh, affect the essential services, we decided to, what do you call, uh, have a separate zookeeper cluster that allows to stomp to go run separately, and it, uh, the essential services were running in a separate zookeeper cluster. And uh, that allowed to scale the storm to a few hundred nodes, but that was not enough. We were still having some issues with the zookeeper. Then as a stopgap measure, we added the beefy zookeeper nodes, so where it, the, we were adding like a, a powerful hardware as well as flash so that the writes on the zookeeper goes much faster. And uh, that again bought us some time uh, before we can analyze what is the problem. And again, it was not sufficient enough. So when we looked at the zookeeper in uh, detail, what is the traffic that was going between storm workers as well as uh, uh, and what is received on the zookeeper, there were two uh, type of data that was being exchanged with the zookeeper. One is the Kafka spout. So the Kafka spout has this notion of offset and slash partition. When the spouts are consuming data from uh, those partitions of Kafka, it was writing the offsets, like hey, this is the uh, last offset that I read from, uh, so that uh, when the Kafka spout fails and brought up in a different node, it knows where to start off. So that offset was being written at every two seconds, and that was the kind of saturating the zookeeper write traffic. And the 33% of the uh, uh, other uh, zookeeper traffic was what he called as a storm runtime. It's essentially what we call as the heartbeats. And the heartbeats are the mechanism that are used to detect uh, machine failures as well as process failures. And these are all also as returned to zookeeper rather than going directly to Nimbus in order to uh, identify the failures. And these two were causing the uh, zookeeper to saturate it very quickly because all of these 100% were writes and it's very, uh, and especially at a high cluster of a few thousand nodes, all the nodes are getting, uh, hitting the zookeeper, which caused the zookeeper to crawl. So, so as a stopgap measure, we did something. So what do you call, oops. Yeah, so stopgap measure, what we did is like uh, we rerouted those two traffic into something called a heartbeat daemon. And uh, so the heartbeat daemons essentially formed their own small set of cluster with a three or so like three to five nodes. And all the heartbeats were sent to uh, those daemons. And uh, there was uh, another, uh, the Kafka uh, offsets were returned into something called a key value store. And uh, so this kind of uh, uh, did not affect the zookeeper and bought us some time about what we can do in the overall architecture. But this had some issues as well where the heartbeat beat demons can go down, and even uh, there was uh, a few rack outages. And during the time, the heartbeat demons went down, and some of the relocation of the jobs were not happening. So this is more of a stopgap measure, which was not a great design. So then um, when you look at the storm deployment, so it was taking a lot of time to get a job from a, a development into production because uh, the way we deployed was like uh, in a Mesos cluster because Twitter is big into Mesos. And uh, so Mesos manages the entire Storm cluster, which was kind of separate from the regular cluster. And uh, the topologies were deployed in such a way that each topology takes its own set of machines. Instead of sharing machines at a granular level, the machines were allocated in a whole, as a whole to a particular topology. So for example, uh, if you have this a cluster of machines, and when Joe submits his topology, he sets, takes his own set of machines. And uh, when uh, Jane submits a topology, he gets, she gets his own set of machines. 
And similarly, when Dave submits topology, and he gets his own set of machines. Now, if one of the topologies, uh, sorry, the nodes that is running a topology goes down, uh, Nimbus will pick up another node and assigns to that fail node, and uh, the fail node can be repaired and put back into the cluster. So this was not uh, very uh, good from a resource consumption point of view, because even if uh, uh, some topology was just taking like two and a half nodes or two and a quarter kind of node, the rest of the three quarter of the node or the half of the node is wasted. So, but this is the way we were running, because uh, since there was no resource res reservation at the Nimbus level, we need to make sure that uh, each topology does not trample on each other, uh, so that we don't uh, get into all kind of these performance issues. And uh, in addition to that, we have a few more uh, issues, essentially like one is efficiency. So in order to find out whether a, a topology is actually taking the right amount of CPUs, we decided to write a simple program, which kind of essentially does the same thing like what a topology does to compare uh, how much the topology was actually consuming. So that simple program that we wrote took just 75 cores at a 30% CPU utilization. But at the same time, in equivalent topology that we were running, so it took 600 cores and uh, in order to do the same thing. So which means like there is an 8x difference in resource consumption. So there, so there was something wrong in the whole equation. So um, the next one is like uh, there's no batching at all. In the, the Storm is a more of a tuple-oriented system. And uh, so it uh, takes a tuple, processes it, and outputs a tuple, and that output tuple goes all the way down to the communication layer. And there is some implicit batching done by the 0MQ, but at the time the tuple reaches that 0MQ uh, layers, uh, you already had experience and it's a lot of overhead on a per tuple level. So then the third one is there is no notion of a back pressure. So if, uh, there, uh, if one bolt is sending data to uh, another bolt, and that other bolt is busy for a certain reason or is running on a slower machine, there is uh, uh, the center bolt looks at it, oh, that uh, receiver is not accepting the data, so I'll just drop it. So because of that, it's, um, it's very unpredictable in the sense like uh, the, you have no idea uh, when, uh, when some errors are being introduced into the job, you have no idea what is causing it unless uh, we have a lot of graphs and go and look into the machine whether there is slowness is being detected and all. So it became a, so instead a back pressure would have a mechanism would self-adjust the topology so that everybody goes at the pace of the slowest one. So these were the, all the issues that we were facing in Storm, and uh, at that point we have to do something about it. One is either we evolve Storm to fix all the issues, or consider a, uh, using existing open solu source solutions, or the third option is to develop a new engine. So we looked at uh, evolving storm, and uh, then we uh, questioned ourselves if we are going to change some of the architectures very fundamentally, because ultimately storm is nothing but a bunch of queues moving data around. And if we are going to change those fundamental architecture, um, we, we thought like uh, we can do much faster doing a new system as compared to fixing a older system. The second aspect was like we considered a lot of open sources. Uh, and and most of them had issues working at scale, the, the scale that we wanted. And the one of the another important decision was it was incompatible API. In the sense like uh, we had a lot of investment in Storm API, as well as the layers that are built on top of it. And uh, it will be, if we don't have an incompatible API, that will be a long migration process, and we have to live with two systems at any given time. So, um, so then we decided, uh, after uh, we debated about these two, then we decided, OK, we ought to go for a new system. And that's when uh, Heron was born. And uh, so what does Heron design goals are? So the first design goal is it should be fully API compatible with Storm so that uh, any migration should be as easy as possible as like changing a line in the compilation. And you should be able to launch the job right away. So then it should provide task isolation. And uh, in the sense like, um, it should uh, allow you to have your task running on your own set of own process so that you can debug it as well as profile it and uh, you can do heap dump on it you can do all kind of cool stuff so then uh, we wanted to introduce mainstream languages which uh, unlike closure which was uh, not a mainstream languages where you cannot get a uh, lot of talent and get productive right away so we wanted to go with some mainstream languages which are like c++ java and python and of course, as I mentioned, we want to have a back pressure so that topology can self-adjust itself 
uh, during runtime. And we wanted to support batching so that uh, if you can trade off between if you want a throughput system versus a latency specific system. And finally, we wanted to make sure that uh, the SAFE system is efficient so that we can reduce our resource consumption. So, so after looking at it, when we questioned about the fact, do we need to have a scheduler in the first place? Because uh, when we looked at it, I mean, Storm was designed at a time when the schedulers were not uh, well matured enough. So now looking at uh, last year or the year before last year, the schedulers were there, like Eon and Mesos were kind of progressing nicely, and there were community behind it for to support all of them. So, so then we decided, made a conscious choice that, OK, since scheduler is evolving nicely, we don't want to be in the writing another scheduler, at another scheduler. Instead, let's piggyback on an existing scheduler, and those scheduler buy all of the uh, task isolation as well as resource distribution, everything. Because by mapping those, uh, some of those uh, processes into containers, the container and C group containers, they enforce all of them. So they are come for free. So, so we took an off the shelf scheduler, and uh, within Twitter, we have. Um, uh, Mesos, and we have something called Aurora, which both are open source. And Aurora is a scheduler, uh, job scheduler built on top of Mesos. So we went with an Aurora, actually. So whenever you submit a job uh, or a topology, it's essentially submitting a job to a scheduler, which is well established. And uh, the topology is nothing but a job. And the, all the topologies are run by the scheduler as uh, multiple sort of what you call as containers. So if you look at uh, the individual topology architecture, um, each topology has its own set of master, which is called the topology master. This is similar to the lines of Yawn used to have that application master. And uh, so the topology master in, um, is responsible for the entire topology. And uh, see, it breaks down this uh, entire topology into multiple containers. And these containers are the schedulable units for the scheduler. And each of the container contains something called a stream manager, which is essential for uh, all of the data to be routed between the various tasks. And uh, there is another um, thing called metrics manager that collects all the metrics that are accumulated by the system so that for support and troubleshooting. And uh, the, the workers became what you call instances. So unlike the storm workers, where there was a lot of multiplex, uh, multiplexing of tasks on a single worker was going on, instead the instance is running only one task, nothing else. So instead, like. Uh, so you don't have any issue of uh, multiplexing, demultiplexing. Instead, the multiplexing, demultiplex complexity is moved to the stream manager. So um, then the, when the topology master comes up, it looks at the topology and identifies its uh, logical plan and it generates a physical plan. And that physical plan is stored into the Zookeeper cluster. And um, since the Zookeeper cluster is not involved anywhere in the data path, uh, we just use the Zookeeper ju for just a state recovery. Just so that when the topology master kind of dies and comes back in a, what you call in a different uh, node, it can pick up the state from the Zookeeper cluster. That reduces the, there's, which means there is no traffic to Zookeeper except whenever there's a state change. And uh, when those containers come up, the stream manager in turn talks to the, goes to the Zookeeper to discover where the topology master is. And the moment uh, uh, it gets those uh, port of where the topology master is, it contacts topology master and syncs the physical plan. And once it, uh, the physical plan is synced across all the stream manager, everybody is let go, and the data is processed. And the topology master is never involved in the data path at all. So the topology master essentially like, uh, does three things. Monitoring of the containers, and it acts as a gateway for metrics to be exposed to the UI. And finally, it kind of assigns a role, in the sense like whenever users submit a job, uh, he has this notion of a role. And within the role, uh, it allows you to aggregate the capacity used by a particular team and all the various things so that we can do reporting about how much the entire resource usage is for a particular topology, for a group's uh, resources of the real-time analytics, as well as for the entire company. So a topology master essentially like, uh, breaks, uh, takes a topology information and uh, breaks that into a physical plan, depending upon uh, uh, the, how many instances of uh, each task that you wanted to run. Essentially, like the spout or the bold, you have specified how many tasks that you wanted to run. It looks at it and creates a motion of execution state that is kept in the Zookeeper cluster. 
And also, it prevents multiple uh, TMs becoming a master because, uh, uh, because of the fact that it has a, a, a Zookeeper watch node available on it. And uh, it also other process to discover a TM so that uh, they can sync their physical plan. So the stream manager is one of the very important components in the entire system. So it is essentially routes the tuples, essentially like uh, take the data from the instance. And once the uh, data comes to stream manager, it decides where the data has to be sent to, and accordingly packs that data and sends it to other stream manager if they are in a different container. Or if it is in the uh, other instances in the same container, then bounces off from there. And it also implements the back pressure. And uh, so that allows you to uh, make the topology go as fast as the slowest one. Then also it uh, manages the acts. I'm not sure about uh, how many people have know about the storm act mechanism. But uh, the storm act mechanism is the only way uh, uh, we can guarantee at least one semantics. In other words, uh, when a tuple is enters the system, we build a, what you call as a tuple tree uh, that is rooted at the tuple, and all its descendants are processed, then the original tuple is uh, retired. And the whole mechanism for managing this uh, tuple tree, as well as what part of the tuples have been processed or not, or uh, is taken, is managed by the entire ACK mechanism. So, but I won't go into the details of those. If you want, you can take a look at the paper. And uh, so in order to illustrate the stream manager, let's take a simple uh, linear topology, which is as a simple spout S1 uh, that feeding into bolt B2. And um, from bolt B2, it goes to another bolt B3, and followed by another bolt B4. So if we take a look at it, how the topology uh, gets realized in the physical hardware, so you will have a, a four containers, let us, for the sake of simplicity, and let us assume that four instances of each one of those uh, spout and bolts is being run. And uh, so you have one stream manager per container, and all the stream managers connect themselves to form a fully directed graph. So, so that everybody, there is a communication path between every instance possible. So now, so like uh, this uh, architecture allowed us to scale in the sense like uh, instead of in each instance is connecting to other instance, instead the stream managers are the only one they are connecting, which means the number of instances versus the number of stream managers is there's a difference in, in uh, what do you call uh, the order of n square to k square, where k is much less for the stream managers, and which means the number of sockets and the ports that you consume is reduced. So then. Uh, now let us look at uh, what kind of back pressure mechanisms. So you know, before we designed the back pressure mechanisms, we looked at uh, different approaches. What are the different approaches that we can think of? So we all know DCP has a back pressure mechanism, because whenever sender and receiver talk to each other, uh, the sender kind of adjusts to the pace of what the receiver can do. So can we piggyback rather than designing our own back pressure mechanism? So, so that is the TCP back pressure mechanism. The next second one is called a spout based uh, back pressure. In other words, like uh, if the back pressure is, ha if uh, some node is going slow or some bolt is going slow, why can't we go to the source of the data and clamp it down so that there's no more data entering into the whole um, uh, topology itself? So, um, so that's called spout based back pressure. And the third one is called stage based back pressure. In other words, like uh, if you look at the DAG, you can think about uh, one set of bolts as one stage, the next set of bolts as another stage. So at every stage, the back pressure is gradually propagated until it reaches the source. That is the stage-wise back pressure mechanism. So let me go through a couple of them and illustrate some of the issues and what we implemented. So if you look at the back, uh, take the TCP back pressure mechanism. So with the take TCP back pressure mechanism, let us assume that uh, bolt, uh, one instance of uh, bolt B2 is slowing down on the upper left container. So then uh, the, what it, the TCP mechanism will do is it will clamp down on the other stream manager. Hey, don't send any more data to me because I'm slowing down. So which means if uh, since B3 has to communicate to B4, and since the, other, uh, the B4 on the upper left container has some uh, data to be received from the B3 from the other guys, for example, this B3, if you want to send to the B4 that is running on the same container as uh, the slowing down B2, it won't be able to take any data at that point. So this is what it uh, slows down the upstream and the downstream components. And uh, we can prove that it is more of a count infinity where the topology can come to a grinding halt and where no real work is being done. So, 
So that is the problem with the TCP back pressure. The reason, the underlying reason is um, we are trying to uh, map multiple logical channels into a single physical, uh, into a shared physical channel, and you're clamping the physical channel because one logical channel was kind of uh, bottlenecked. So instead, we decided to go with uh, what you call the spout back, uh, back pressure. So what happens in this case is uh, you, whenever uh, the B2 slows down in the upper left container, so the, an explicit back pressure message is initiated, and that is broadcasted to all the stream manager who is feeding data to B2. And uh, so once you send this back pressure messages, then uh, all the stream managers react by uh, what do you call clamping down their spouts. So since the spouts were the sources of uh, data, by clamping down on the spout, we can let the data to process and settle down before we can open up the spouts again. So. And this worked well in practice, except that the fact that you can go into what you call this oscillating mode, where you open up the spouts, then let the back pressure occur again, then you clamp it down. So it can go into this uh, oscillating state. So in order to avoid this oscillating state, the stream manager had this couple of uh, watermarks, like low watermark and a high watermark in terms of the buffering, so that um, so the back pressure is uh, initiated when the data goes beyond the high threshold watermark. And then it, the back pressure is relieved only when the data goes beyond the low, low water threshold watermark, so that uh, you have get that smooth behavior. And uh, the, then we looked at the third back pr back pressure mechanism called stage-wise back pressure. And the reason why we didn't implement it, first of all, it's a bit complex. The second one is like uh, it requires a lot of message exchanges before it can settle down on the back pressure, because every time it, there has to be a broadcast of messages from one stage to the next stage before it can slow it down. So that's why, like the so ultimately we the uh, we implemented the back uh, spout back pressure and that's working seems to work very well in practice. So we let it go. So now let's focus on a Heron instance. And a Heron instance, unlike the Storm Worker, just runs only one task, either a spout task or a bolt task, and it supports the Storm API. And uh, we have a underlying Heron API also, which is kind of very close to similar to Storm, but there are also other enhancements that we made. But uh, since uh, one of the goals is to be compatible with Storm API, we made a compatible layer on top of this Heron API so that all the Storm programs can run without any changes. And it collects several metrics that could be used for troubleshooting and support. So like uh, the Heron architect instance is very simpler at this point. So it has only two threads, and uh, it takes a gate. Uh, the, there is a notion of a gateway thread and where the data is coming from the stream manager, and the gateway thread uh, kind of uh, takes the data and puts it into another uh, in queue, which is a, uh, within a process queue, and puts it into a task execution thread where your user logic code is running. And the, once the data is being generated out of the task execution thread, the data is out and pushed into the gateway thread. And similarly, the metrics that are being collected at the uh, task execution thread will uh, go into the metrics out queue and goes to the metrics manager. And the gateway thread, in turn, uh, sends it to the, if that's a data, then it goes to stream manager. If it is the metrics, it goes to the metrics manager. Then it goes to what we call observability. So with this short introduction about Heron, let us, me share some of the operational experiences with you. So like, uh, so just the uh, internal architecture alone is not enough in order to deploy a working system. So we need to do a bunch of other toolization around it in order to ensure that it's uh, running smoothly and users can interact with the topology and jobs. So, so in addition to all the, uh, the hardcore uh, Heron instances, Heron Stream Manager, as well as Topology Master, we also wrote a, what we call a Heron Tracker, which is kind of emulates a, a Hadoop Job Tracker. And that acts as a gateway for collecting all the statistics about all the topologies and everything. And also like a, a Heron Web, which serves the actual UI. And the Heron Wiz, in turn, actually like uh, uh, look, allows you to look at what you call the timeline trends of all the metrics that you're collecting, so that we can pinpoint any support issues that are occurring at any given point in time. So, so some of the sample topologies that we run are like uh, are of all shapes that can vary in very simplistic topologies that you can see with uh, like four components to all the way that has 50 components. And some of these topologies are not hand-coded. Instead, they're being generated by higher-level layers, which is like, uh, I think we, we use something called a summing board, uh, which allows to generate these uh, topologies 
and summing bird is a more of higher level declarative paradigm using Scala. So then uh, the, the UI allows to visualize how the topology looks like and uh, how the containers are being uh, uh, distributed across uh, the nodes and what containers are running what. And uh, if there are any issues right away, then you can see it within this itself. For example, uh, whether the GC is causing any issues. So by looking at this UI itself, you can see where the problem is at any given time, and you can drill down further into what is causing that issue. So officially, we have decommissioned Storm. And uh, I mean, I can't give all the numbers, but um, we are running on the largest cluster, and hundreds of topologies are running on Heron right now. And uh, billions of messages are being processed every day. And uh, hundreds of terabytes of data moves within Heron right now. And uh, after putting Heron into production, the number of incidents have reduced dramatically uh, because of the reliability as well as the ability to debug profile and all the various things. So then finally, when we counted the resource usage, we saw 3x reduction in resource usage. So now let me give you an idea about how we compare uh, uh, the performance of Heron with uh, Storm. So there were like um, two different set of topologies that we compared with. One is the word count topology. And the word count topology is actually the worst case for any streaming engine, because the streaming engine essentially nothing but uh, moving data around. So word count topology, it, uh, the amount of processing that's being done in the bolt and the spout is so minimal that it's essentially stressing your, uh, how fast you can move data around. So, um, so with respect to word count topology, um, so uh, we varied the number of spout and bolts, and uh, the storm workers is kind of loosely the equivalent to Heron containers. And uh, we varied the numbers as well. And uh, so that we can compare apples to apple, apples. So with at least once, so at least once means like uh, your uh, data is guaranteed to be processed at least once, but it's possible that could be processed more than once in the case of failures. And uh, in this case, like, uh, so we measured the throughput. As you can see, Heron's uh, throughput was like uh, approximately around 10 to 15x uh, greater than even Storm. And uh, similarly, like uh, you can even look at the latency. The latency experienced by a tuple that goes through the Heron is much lower compared to Storm as well. And uh, the number of Xs is somewhere around 10 to 14x in uh, increase in performance, and another 5 to 15x in increase in, I mean, decrease in latency. Similarly, in at least one case, if you look at the CPU usage in the uh, word count topology, we got a 2 to 3x reduction in the CPU core usage. I mean. This is the CPU usage is measured in terms of the number of cores, because that's the way we report it, rather than being as a percentage. And the number of cores is significantly lower. Now, in the utmost ones where you make the best effort, so the performance of Heron is even higher than Storm, because uh, the at least once, the actuples have to be flowed back, which means you're moving twice the amount of data uh, in at least once. Uh, case, whereas in utmost case, you're just moving only once. So the Heron throughput is even much higher than there. And since there is no end-to-end -end latency, if the, you can even see the CPU usage is, again, much lower there as well. So now, like, uh, to, to kind of compare with the another topology, so we did another topology that computes what you call a real-time active user count. And uh, so this topology uh, takes a, what you call a a consistent input rate, and see what is the topology experiences in terms of latency and how much CPU it uses. So in at least one case, again, the latency is just like 4x better. And uh, again, like the CPU usage also like was probably like 3 to 4x consistently. We were consistently observing across all the topologies on board. And again, with that most once as well, the CPU usage was like, uh, what do you call it? Again, 3x to 4x very easily. So, so we, the, the performance that we got was very phenomenal. And when we looked at why we were getting this performance uh, compared to what we had in Storm, it's ultimately the, found out that uh, how efficient uh, the data movement has to occur, especially in terms of the uh, tuple overhead and the batching that we did. So those two were the great contributors in terms of uh, uh, how the performance that we got. Even though, like, if you look at it, there is a, a data is going from uh, not one instance to directly to another instance where there's no min copying or anything involved. 
Whereas here we are jumping the data or the data is going from one instance to stream manager, from stream manager to other stream managers, or even from the stream stream manager to the same instance in the same container. So, so in spite of that, we still got uh, this much speed up. And one thing that I want to point out, like we never made any effort yet in order to what you call uh, optimize the performance. So after uh, the, finish, uh, the initial set of coding and the deployment, itself we got a lot of this performance. So if you are interested in learning more about uh, Heron, we uh, published a paper in uh, Sigma 2015, and you can take a look at it. Uh, we have a storm paper also that got published in Sigma 2014. You can take a look at that as well. So the conclusion was, in systems, a simplified architecture always goes a long way in terms of performance and easy to debug and uh, profile and support. And uh, it also allows you to have a high performance, which is like we consistently that we saw, which is 7 to 10x increase in throughput, as well as 5 to 10x decrease in latency. And of course, 3 to 5x decrease in resource usage as well. So that's all I had. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions.